That was a, a perfect song before, um, because I think it, what the Psalms do, or at least I hope they do, um, and why we need to gather again is because it's easy to become overwhelmed and lose what we once had. It's like when Jesus said, you, you guys have left your first love. And having our first love has a whole bunch of things. There's an enormous amount of emotional well-being comes with that first love with Christ. There's an excitement to share. There, there are all these things. There's a trust in his miracles and all those things. All that stuff is there. But when we lose our ability to focus on him, then we get absorbed with the urgency of life, the urgency of near disasters, the urgency of worrying about what is going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day after that. And I wanted to bring us back, um, before we open Psalm 73, I wanted to bring us back to, um, to Mark 10. What we studied on Sunday... And they go, but what about us? We've been through all this with you, Jesus. And But what, what are you going to do for us? And he said, truly I say to you that there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children for our sake, for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and farms, along with persecution. But... But we keep coming back because we're sort of hopeful and that there are charlatans out there that will sort of present a false or a partial gospel. But Jesus said, oh yeah, I have rewards for you. Yeah, 100 times. A lot of people talk about the, oh, it's the 100 times. I'm going to get a double portion. Like I want the double portion. And Elijah says to Elisha, um, wow, you really want a double the portion that I have? Because... That single portion I have come with a lot of persecutions. But often we talk about, I want this hundredfold. He goes, yeah, I'll give you that. And plus, there are going to be persecutions, which is nice for us <laughs> to sing about because when, when we sing about the song that they led us through, those persecutions tend to make us forget where we started from. And that, that true love affair with, with Jesus that um, the old saints try to drill out of the young saints for some strange reason. Oh, yeah, you'll get over that enthusiasm after a little while. <laughs> which, which that's the exact flame we should be fanning, right? Oh, yeah, no, don't, you can't talk to people that boldly about, the, about faith in Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, we have a, a more subtler way of doing it which is code word for saying so we don't have to really do it at all, right? Because you know all those people that you offended? Yeah, we shouldn't do that, even though Jesus said, if you talk of me, you'll offend them, right? But what the Psalms do, it takes us back, and we're in this sort of, we're, we're sort of almost in this, oh my gosh, oh, it's great, oh, it's horrible, oh, it's great, oh, it's horrible. But that's a lot of what our life is in Christ. Oh, you'll get a hundredfold blessing, and there'll be persecutions, right? So if you turn with, your, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 73, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're just an honest God to us, um, but you're honest all the way that you can do all things and nothing is too hard for you and that you will never leave us or forsake us and you do have a plan and you do all things well. And Lord, let us come back often to the memorial stones of the great, almighty, miraculous God that you are. When Satan would like us to live in times when we're not sure if you're there. So teach us through your Psalms um, tonight, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the Psalms, we've entered out of the time of David, and there'll be a few more Davidic Psalms coming up because they sort of get mixed around. It's sort of, if you can, if you want a, another way to think of the Psalms, um, 
It's sort of like a church over years having a notebook where all the songs that this church sings gets added to. And you have other worship leaders that come in and go, well, I want to use this song. And then they go, well, I want to take this song from this part and this part I want to put together. And now it's going to be a new song we sing, right? So if you think of the book of Psalms as like our, what we have a notebook that has, I don't know, a hundred and something odd songs that have been sung at this church at some time. And then whoever is leading, they pray and God shows them what songs he would like them to sing for this service or the service coming up. <clears throat> so there were um, uh, 11 um, in this sort of next range, seven th 73 through 83 have been ascribed to Asaph. Um, he also probably wrote um, Psalm 50. Um, but it might not be the same Asaph. Right? It might not be the same, and it probably isn't the same Asaph that was coming down through David's line. Uh, because of the what he's talking about, so we're gonna we're gonna start out with Psalm seventy three as a wisdom hymn, and it's sort of like if you were to take the Book of Job and condense it right into like a few verses, it's going to give us sort of these are the way things work, and these are our emotions that we'll have as God walks us through difficult times. Um, um, and it sort of talks about how Satan is going to attempt to trip us up. Um, so it's a beautiful song to, psalm to start with because it gives us sort of a foundation of these are the emotions that you can expect to go through as a believer in Christ. And then sometimes you're going to go through and think it's all, it, it's all horrible and we're not going to be able to get out of it and then God comes and does a rescue. And then we're going to have a couple of psalms that he doesn't come and rescue. But he's still there. Um, I, one of my favorite songs that Natalie Grant sang called Held. There's uh, a line in there that, 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 that there was no sudden healing. Like, often we have a timeline on when we expect God, well, in my lifetime, I expect to see this. In my lifetime, I want to see this. I want to see this now. I want to see this, Lord, I need a miracle from you right away. And sometimes he goes, no, no, that's not the plan. And so we have this wisdom hymn, and then we're going to have at least a couple that are going to be about the Babylonian takeover, and then a couple about the Assyrians. So we'll start in. Um, <clears throat> And so we need to start out, the first point as we get to verse 1 is really a believer in proper thinking. So surely God is good to Israel and those who are pure in heart. So basically this is describing who God is. We have to understand that um, and what they were talking as this group of people that have been brought out of Egypt that God was good to them. Even when there were centuries of captivity as slaves. Okay. We have maybe, a, you, you have very little talk of that, the captivity of Israel as slaves in Egypt, right? You hear them go down, they get the best of the land. Then the next thing you hear about them is they're slaves, right? There's not a lot of discussion in between. And I think for us, when we think of those sentences, we think, oh, that was a short period of time. When God was silent after the book of um, Malachi was written and there were no longer prophets in the land, that was hundreds of years when there was no prophet. There were no prophets in the land at all. So in those times, they needed to remember that surely God is good to Israel and those who are pure in heart. Because often when God left Israel, why did he leave them? It's because they were no longer pure in heart. They were serving other gods. They had, they had left what he had called them to do. When Jesus sees us going away that we're no longer purely devoted to him, what does he call us? Adulterous, right? He says, we have left, you have left your first love. So when he brings this about, that's when our, our heart is no longer pure because now we are going after other things that captivate us 
And so our love is now not wholly devoted. I'm sorry, every time I say wholly devoted, it reminds me of Olivia Newton-John. Um, <laughs> sorry, I keep, I see, I'm trying to teach this and I keep going in the Greece, the musical, you know, I'm just like, wholly devoted. No. <clears throat> But that's what we should have, but just not with the Grease musical involved. Um, and then we have my, I've got white lights flashing in my eyes now. Um, <clears throat> but the second, so the first thing is, is we have to have proper thinking. So when we see ourselves in a situation, I talk about this all the time, when we see ourselves in a situation where, wow, this doesn't look like God is good in this situation, we have to take ourselves back to proper thinking that we are not seeing the whole plan of God. And remember, the whole plan of God can take centuries to come about for the full, fullness of his goodness to be shown in a situation. The second thing is, the, as we go into verse 2, the believer is starting to question the goodness of God. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. And this will, if we look at our hearts, this will now convict us all. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For those who have pride and disbelief is often their stumbling blocks. For those who don't have, envy is their stumbling block. It's the sin of the poor. Okay? Or it's the sin of the pride that they like, well, why, why don't they? I don't have it. But once you start looking, for I was envious of those who were not of God's family. It's an incredibly, it, 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 it really speaks to who we are inside when we become envious of those who are arrogant and the prosperity of the wicked. It's short-sightedness in, in looking at the, that there's this sense, oh, well, but they seem to have it all. <clears throat> you ever read any biographies of all those people who you thought had it all? that had jets and cars and either men or women or whatever it was, and they seemed to have everything. They couldn't have a care in the world. And they're so taking so many drugs so they can sleep at night and they're taking drugs so they can wake up in the morning and then taking drugs so they can sleep at night because they have no peace. Michael Jackson should have had it all. You know what he was doing? He was getting IV anesthesia every night so he could sleep. Like what you would get for a surgery, he was getting that every night. That's what killed him, right? But we have a way of thinking, oh, but if I just had that, I would be happier. And it's the first thing because what you're questioning in is you're questioning your shepherd. Oh, you haven't led me down the, wrong, the right path. What's more likely the case is that you've taken your own path and you left the shepherd a long time ago and he's just allowed you to go about in your free will before hopefully his mercy will bring his shepherd's hook around your neck and pull you back into the flock. Or he might have to break your leg. Hopefully we won't have to do like we did to the bison is just shoot him in the head. <laughs> A lot to be learned, shepherding. <laughs> But this sin of in envy, it's remember it made it in the top 10. <laughs> Not to be envious. And there's so many things we can be envious of. We all sort of like direct it back to money, but you can uh, direct it. You're envious of people's friends, envious of people's pla placement, envious how other people treat them, uh, well, how tall they are, how, whatever it might be, right? For all you guys who's, who really wish you could be tall, um, there's really no way to l add length to pants uh, unless you're in the 60s. So be, be thankful that you can at least hem your pants if you're short. Um, <laughs> free advice on that one. Um, verse 4, For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. And this is just false. This is where Satan takes you down, and he has Asaph believing a lie. That somehow, if they're just doing whatever they want, and they have no cares at all, that they're happy. And it's just not true. 
This is where Pascal says we all have that God-shaped hole and we will try everything the world has to offer to put in that hole to make us feel better. And, but there is only one thing that will give us peace. And that is when we find God and that becomes the only thing that fits in that hole. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. They, their, eye, their eye bulges from fatness. Their imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Yeah, we see that happening right now, right? There's mocking of governments. There's mocking of God. A whole lot of mocking. What are you going to do to us? You're going to stop me? I'm going to steal everything out of the store. Or I'm going to beat these people close to death or maybe kill them. What are you going to do? You're going to come and get me? I have a big mob, right? They're basically mocking every we have. We see this in our, in, in our streets right now, all around the world. Therefore, his people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there any, is there knowledge with the most high? Nowadays, we have the huge, a very large su- uh, percentage of the population who are nuns. N-O-N-E, they believe in nothing. They have no religious affiliation at all. They, they could say, how does God know? Who is God? There's no knowledge. He doesn't know what's going on. Behold, these are the wicked, and, and all was at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastised, ch- chastened every morning. Surely in vain. It says that God will come and judge according to our deeds. There is no beautiful thing that you have done. Does the pure in heart get to see God? And all that comes with that. If, if Asaph has kept his heart pure and, and washed my hands in innocence, then surely that is not in vain by the promises of God. Might feel like it, but that's when we have our eyes on the world and not eyes on our Savior. Now, the fourth part of this, he's in, sorry, in verse 15, he starts to worship And when he starts to worship, he starts to recover and remind himself of his foundation. And that's why it's important to come in to the house of God, whatever that is, and come in with other believers and remind ourselves not only in prayer, but in communion and singing and and, uh, teaching out of the word of God of who he is. We We need to remind ourselves by singing those songs. I know the songs you guys are going to sing on Sunday, and these are good songs that we need to sing to remind ourselves of what our foundation is. We go to the, we go to the cross every week with communion to remind ourselves how much we're loved by God and how there is something that takes away our sin. This is taking us back to that beautiful foundation, but it comes with worship. In verse 15, it says, If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Right? He showed up, he came in, and the word of God was spoken, and God basically said, don't worry about it, I will take care of it all in the end. I see it all. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I have the rewards I'm going to hand out, and I will hand them out. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, so important. What kept us, what kept this body of believers vibrant during, during COVID is that we got to meet. And we got to meet daily. We got to have lunches together. You know, when the pantry was open seven days a week, people would come. Uh, I'm really not scheduled to work, but I just like to come out for the morning, hang out. We knew it then, right? 
a whole bunch of other people for no fault of their own were in places where all the churches were closed. We used to have, when we were sneaking around, we had, when people would come over to our house, that's way too many slippers on the front porch. Someone's, the next door neighbor's probably going to narc us out. <laughs> we had people coming at different times through different gates and everything like that. Um, but even a small little time of gathering for four or five, six, seven people in a house, or the brothers and sisters of Christ could gather, you could sense the importance of what that was. You had a little sense of what the, it was, it's like for the persecuted Chinese church when they come together and they, they, they can't sing their worship songs, so they have all these hand motions that they basically sing their songs with so they can stay quiet. And so he, he, he's so overwhelmed by the evil that's around that he's come back in and he's reminded himself. I, I just think of so many times how many they lost, they lost their basis in the word. Um, it, Lloyd was just telling me he was at a church on the mainland and, and the, the one verse was read and then the pastor got up and just spoke about the Lion King. Um, the whole service. The Bible wasn't opened again. This was spoken of. Um, but he understands he understands that we can rest that, that he can rest in God because God will take care of all the things that aren't right a lot of times we are so we have so much emotional energy on trying to take care of the things that aren't right and usually it's emotional energy that really is never effective because there's nothing we can do we're just upset about it all the time right and so it goes around in our mind, but there's nothing we can do about it. We could pray, but we often neglect and don't really fully comprehend the importance of what it means to pray and have an audience with the King of Kings when he has asked us to do so. But so he starts, Asaph starts to understand, surely you set them in slippery places. Okay, they're in a place, but it's, I don't see it slippery, but surely it's slippery. They're going to trip up eventually. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. You know, he's thinking about, yeah, the, the, the chariots and all the Egyptians, they're just about on the heels of the Israelites as they're leaving. Then what happens? All the water comes in. The worship team gets around, the, are on the walls of Jericho, Right? They've been doing silly stuff for a couple for a few days, and now they're going to go around and blow the horns, and everything's going to go crazy, right? Like it's sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes. Oh Lord, when you when aroused, you will despise their form. In verse twenty-one, it says, "When my heart was embittered, and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant, and I was like a beast before you." Um, I think it's always good to remind ourselves of, uh, of this in Philippians. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if, if there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. What had happened to Asaph? Well, when my heart was embittered, And sometimes we find ourselves resting in that bitterness, don't we? We, all, we don't want to leave it. We sort of think about it again. Yeah, boy, when I see them, I'm going to say this to them, and there's no reason. And they, then we find a group of friends who will agree with us, and they help us dwell on the embitteredness as well. And then they might remind us, you know, I was thinking about what you told me. You're right. That person is horrible. There's, you have no right to be treated like that. And so then you have other people who are helping you remain in this place of embitteredness. When the word of God says, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, dwell on these things. What do we have to do to be able to do that? We have to take our minds captive. We have to not just let them go freestyle. When I let my mind go freestyle, it goes freestyle. 
right? I, I'm, I'm just like, whoa, like, what is this road my mind just went down? I have to rebuke it. I have to get it back in line, and I've got to refocus to what God would help have me dwell upon. Because it says in verse 21, when his heart was embittered, in verse 22, he says, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. A beast that has no love for the Savior, who has no trust for the Savior, who has no ability to come and worship the Savior, even when we don't understand what's going on. What Asaph needed to do is remind himself of the eternal perspective and not the earthly perspective. And we need to keep going back to the eternal perspective and the rather than the earthly perspective. We still, it's been a year, guys. It's been a year. And we still really don't have a good earthly perspective of all that went on. All the all the seemed like needless death, ineptitude, people acting badly. Where do we put that? We don't have enough knowledge or understanding or anything to figure out the this is exactly what happened. but we do know there's a sovereign God that we can cast it on him and say, God, this broke my heart. The stories we heard in here, in there, in there, the stories we learned when we were going around up in the, in the Pele and going all around, right? The stories, it was un, unimaginable stories to hear of human suffering. What, what do we do with that? We do what the Bible says, and it says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. That's the beautiful relationship. What do I do with that? Is I come to it. What if it burns me again? I bring it to him again. What if it burns me again? Like th three minutes ago, it burned me, and now it's burned me again. I bring it to him again, and I keep laying it down at his feet because he's the only one who can take it. And we sing this. It was the number one song, right? The goodness of God was the number one song of the Dove Awards this year. It won it all. Right? But we have to rejoice over the goodness of God. I mean, that part, everything he does is good. We, we, that must be an anchor for us. Right? We must not give way in the goodness of God. We can say, I don't understand what's happening here, but we can't give that away. We can't give that away. I don't understand this, but I know my God is good. He deserves that from us, and he proved to us that he loved us and he's good by what he did on the cross. And he said, there's no higher way that I can show you that I love you than this. In verse 23, it says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me. And afterward... Receive me to glory. Yeah, he says, Asaph says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. Actually, what he said is, nevertheless, you are continually with me. <laughs> right? That's, the, that's a, a more proper thing to say. But you have taken hold of my right hand. It's one of those beautiful things when you, when you see the parent reaches down and, and, the, and the child just naturally puts it Puts the hand in, okay, no questions. You'll take me. You'll take me where I need to go. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. Boy, that sounds like a New Testament verse, doesn't it? People like to make distinctions between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It sounds like a New Testament verse, right? 
Yeah, these last couple of verses would have been hard for the Sadducees when there's talk about the future life and the resurrection. <laughs> you know, the Sadducees, oh, that doesn't mean that. But, but I, I think this is good. Can we, can we say this? Can we, can we say this honestly? Could we say this, in, this um, psalm honestly with, with Asaph as he writes it? Whom, I, who, whom have I in heaven but you? I haven't come to worship angels. I haven't come to worship anyone else. I've come to worship you. And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. That's what I was talking about on Sunday, right? Compared to the surpassing greatness of God, what does earth have to offer me? It has the beauty to offer me the body of Christ. Everything else is fleeting. You guys, this is, the, this is the heaven on earth that we'll get to transport up, right? It's the body of Christ. Everything else burns. It all burns, <laughs> except the body of Christ. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't know how I can do this. I don't know how I can go on another step. I don't know how I can go on another day. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? We get back to the truth of the word. Satan comes with, a, with a, a criticism to try to get us worried again, and we come back with the truth of God's word. This is why it's so important to stay in God's word, guys. So important to stay in God's word. For behold... Those who are far from you will perish, and you have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Do you think when people make the Lord their refuge that they get to tell of his good works immediately? It might be. It might be, wow, he saved me right now. Or it might be in a day. Or it might be in a week. Or it might be in a decade. Or it might be in multiple decades that you can say, all my days. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good isn't it beautiful that in James 4, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How do we draw near to God? We come to worship him. We sing songs to him. We pray to him. We trust that he hears us. We remember him in communion. We open his word. We read it out loud. We can hear his voice to us. Psalm 74, this is written... So he, I like 73 because it sort of sets us up. It, like I said, it's like a condensed Job. Like, like here are all the complaints. Oh, why, why, are, why are the righteous doing well? But then he, at the end, he really cleans it all up and he goes, oh yeah, yeah, but you're all that I need. In Psalm 74, it's written at, at, at the, the spare felt after the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And that was in 586. Um, this was a big deal to the, to the social and religious way of life. We, we can't appreciate that because we didn't, we don't, we've never, most of us never lived in a strict Jewish community where all these things had to happen in a certain way. But when the temple was destroyed, Basically, their whole way of life was upended, and all the things that they had done was suddenly gone. And most importantly is that God said, this is where I will dwell among my people. They can trust that I will be in the, above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And then the Ark of the Covenant was gone, and then the temple was destroyed. And so, in a sense, there was no place for God's presence to be, and they felt like God had been removed. But they also know that that ark would have false gods, idols, bow down to it, right? Remember Dagon, <laughs> not once but twice, falls down before it. But suddenly that's gone. So you can imagine how now the despair that they have. But there are a lot of people who weren't the leaders that had to live through that 
that they had no power to change the decisions, but they had to live through that whole discipline of the children of Israel. It was no fault of their own. They had no ability to read. They had no ability to bring out the scrolls. They couldn't do any of those things. They could have a, a, a minor relationship with God, but everything was gone. So right now, the pagan nation is victorious, and there's no way for us to be forgiven of our sins. And so this is what the psalmist says here. Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Right? This is what we will say. The proper thing to say to God is, oh God, why have you rejected us? That's the proper thing to say. What do we add? Stupid things. Forever. You don't know. It hasn't been forever yet, so you can't say that. But we say that. We argue that way. You always, you never, right? We say that how we argue to our spouses is the same way we have stupid arguments with God. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? It was very clear because you were disobedient and you didn't let the land rest. That's why he told you. You're questioning, but the prophets told you why you were getting punished and how long you were getting punished for is because you didn't give the land rest. You didn't even respect the land. You obviously didn't respect him or you respected the land, but he said you, the fact that you didn't respect the land, this was good. It's all right. and now 2,000 years later, more than 2,000 years later, you know what everyone's talking about? Regenerative farming. Wow, you know what? If we let land rest and we do this and this and this, which looks like you just read it right out of the Old Testament, then wow, it's really good for the plants and all the different plants and the animals and the animals get more to graze on and it like works really well. And everyone's like, wow, this is amazing. God said, I told you guys this a long time ago. He says, remember your, um, remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance in this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah, I remember this, um, guys. Do you remember me? I asked you to re remember me once a week. Do you remember me once a week? He could say that at the Christian church. Um, I asked you basically as, as much as you get together that do this that in remembrance of me. Well, I, yeah, I know, but we didn't want it to get old and redundant, so we just don't do it that often. Hmm. But now you're going to talk about the Lion King instead of my word? So well, what else are you going to forget about m me? Turn your footsteps toward the perpetual ruins. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards for signs. Yeah, they did. They brought in their idols into the courtyard of the, of the Temple Mount. Brought it right in there. It was Titus during the... Um, then the enemy has damaged... Sorry, it's not, not, not Titus. Turn your... Turn your um, uh, turn your footsteps toward the perpetual ones. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of, of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards for signs. It seems as if one had lifted up his ask, a, axe in a forest of trees, and now all its carved work they smash with hatchet and hammers. This is the beauty of Solomon's temple that's going away. They have burned your sanctuary to the ground. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. God, don't you see what they're doing? Yeah, I see what they're doing, and that's because you forgot about me. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name forever?
Well, you have a certain amount of punishment you're going to get for the land. But why God left is pretty clearly spelled out in Scripture. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It's Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It's all there. Right? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, from within your bosom? Destroy them. They are reaping what they sowed. Verse 12, yet God is my king from of old who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. So now he's finished his lament and he's starting to, re re what, he's, what probably is happening is the Holy Spirit is bringing things back to remembrance, right? As he's starting to accuse God, the Holy Spirit is probably saying, um, so what about when I did this? And what about when I did this? who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. You divided by the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. He's starting to remind himself that God is a deliverer. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You broke open springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also is the night. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Basically, they're saying, we, we know you have the power. We're reminded of the power. We have a history that pr pr proves that you can do it, but why not now? The Jews who were dying in the, in the gas chambers often quoted Psalm 22. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. God could say, yeah, um, yeah, those people spurned my name, but so did you. Do not deliver the soul of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. Consider the covenant for the dark places of the land are full of the habitation of violence. Please don't forgive us. Forget us. Please don't forget us. Okay. So what now you're seeing is they're declaring who God is, and now you're seeing the heart of Asaph is starting to turn back towards God. Repent. Just in case you're wondering what kind of teaching is going out there among many large churches in the U.S., someone came out very strong on Twitter and said, repent does not mean turn from your sins. It just means change your mind. Very well-known leader of a law, large, large church teaching. It's not about sins. It's about just changing your mind. Let not the oppressed return dishonored. Let the afflicted and needy praise your name. See, the afflicted and needy often feel the most of the brunt from bad leadership. They're not the ones who got to make the decisions. They're not the ones who said we're not going to do this. They're not the ones who married the foreign wives or anything like that. But they're the ones who often feel the brunt of the bad leadership. And so I love this, let the afflicted and needy praise your name. Well, they're probably going to play, praise their name first before all the people who were evil and took their country down the wrong way. Arise, O God, and plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man re reproaches you all day long. Do not forget the voices, voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who rise against you, which ascends continually. It's amazing because God sort of handles this much better than we do, doesn't he? Jesus going to the cross handled this much better than we would, right? 
We have a lot of things. Oh, I'm going to speak out about that. I'm going to speak out about this. Oh, you're not going to mock me. You're not going to talk to me like that. Nobody talks to me like that, right? You're not going to dishonor me. You're not going to dishonor my mother. You're not going to dishonor this. Oh, no, we're going to brawls for this. Thank you. Not Jesus. In Psalm 75, this is a praise hymn for what God did to the Assyrians. Remember what he did to the Assyrians? Assyrians came down and mocked during time of the King Hezekiah. Assyrians came down and mocked like, you know what? We don't care about your gods. We don't care about anything. I'm going to speak so everybody can hear. I'm not going to speak in just your dialect. I want everybody to hear because we're not afraid of any of these villages. All those villages that had idols and everything like that, we destroyed all those villages. So we're going to destroy your village as well. That was what was coming up. Then in the night, God killed 185,000 of them. So this is their praise hymn. Right? We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men declare your wondrous works. I, I read this. This quote came out of Wiersbe, and I really liked it. It said, true worship centers on the Lord and not on us our personal problems, or our felt needs. I think that's really a struggle with us because a lot of times we want to sing about our, about our, um, our felt needs. But if this is a worship service to God, you know what we do? We worship Him. We don't complain about our needs, right? If this is a worship service to Him, we worship Him. And so everything should be about Him, right? So we have to be very careful with that because we can write up a lot of really nice songs that we might want to sing, but they're not worship songs to Him. And so if we've come on Sunday morning, we need to worship Him. Not go about, oh, but what you do for me? No, Him. Okay? And, and I love that quote because a lot of times if we start taking the focus off just Him, it's not become a worship service to Him. It's about all of us and talking about like group therapy thing. But the only reason that our group gets therapy is because we go to Him, right? He is our comfort. He is our console. Where do we take everything that's going on in the world to say, what do we do with this? The only way I can make sense of it and have peace is go, but I know who God is. And I've read the end of the book. But Satan will even want to take good things and get us where we're not here praising God. We're singing songs that make us feel good. No, this is, this is all because he is worthy of all the praise. When I, select, when I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. There's a lot of talk about we need to be the ones about equity. God says, I will select an appointed time and I will be the one who comes to make things Right. God decides when to bring his justice. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. Selah. That's a good place for a, a Selah. The earth and all who dwelt in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. God says, I'm the one who has it. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with insolent pride. This is what God said. For not from the east nor the west nor the desert comes exaltation. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed. And he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Asaph concludes by saying, but as for me, I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob and all the horns of the wicked he will cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Now, Psalm 7, 76, this was about battles. And once again, this is about God's judgment on the Assyrians. But when they played songs on battles, they used, they used an instrument similar to a hammer dulcimer. Um, so they were, where they actually hit the actually hit the, um, the strings. Um, 
And it says in 76.1, God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. His tabernacle is in Salem. His dwelling place also is in Zion. There he broke the flaming arrows and the shield and the sword and the weapons of war, Selah. And that was clearly God, right? That was all God with the Assyrians, with Sennacherib. Right? And then Sennacherib, sort of, who was so filled with pride, went home and got killed by his sons. Right? And then he was done, gone. Basically, the end of the Assyrian Empire. You were resplendent, more majestic than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered. They sank into deep, and none of the warriors could use his hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse were cast into a dead sleep. You, even you, are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God rose to judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. For the wrath of man shall praise you. With a remnant of wrath, you will gird yourself. Um, This is a hard translation. I think the best way to describe it is it's like collecting your enemy's weapon, weapons and using them against them. You ever watch people in battle and they're, as, as, the, as an army runs in retreat and they leave a whole bunch of people are picking up like bandoliers of weapons and stuff like that. And God's saying, basically, as, as this battle goes forward, even the things that you were going to use against the people, God will use against you. He picks that up. Your wrath he uses. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all who are around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. This reminds me of, of Romans 12.1. Romans, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What, what can we bring him? What, what, what gifts do we have to bring God? Okay. What, bring, what do we have to give him? Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. What did he ask for us to do? Give, us your, give me your bodies. Follow me. I'm going to be your shepherd. Give me your body and follow me. He will cut off the spirit of princes and he is feared um, by the kings of the earth. So this last one we'll finish up with, it goes pretty quickly. It's Psalm 77. We're back to the humiliation of the Jews at the hands of the Babylonians. So, so you have a worship leader who's having to sort of recall the history of the Jews. And so there are songs that sort of bring them to repentance, like, remember when you guys did this? And then there are songs that talk about how great God is. So much sort of like a church service, there would be a song that you might feel very convicted of, of your sins, and there might be another song that when you sing, it sings to the greatness of God. My voice rises to God and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted. When I think about this in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. This reminds me of Isaiah 40, 49.8, which talks about that day of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 6.2, it says, um, uh, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Right? While it is still day, don't miss this opportunity to turn back towards God, repent of sins, and enjoy His forgiveness. In verse 3, it says, When I remember God, then I am disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. You have held my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of long ago. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. There are lots of things to ponder, aren't there? Lots of things we don't understand. Will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? 
Has this promise come to an end forever? Lord, this was once a land that, that, that loved you. It was filled with people who loved you, Christ. We had such a horrible thing happen to us last year. Could you bring a revival to us? We could really use it. Things aren't getting better here. They're getting worse. And the, and the smallest of people, it's, it, those are the ones who are getting the... You, what about the needy and the afflicted, God? There's a lot to ponder here, right? At, at this one-year anniversary, has God forgotten to be gracious or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? Selah, I'm just going to pause and think about that. Has God forgotten to be gracious? No, he hasn't forgotten to be gracious. Is there something we're needing to learn? Individuals, collectively... Has he withdrawn his compassion? No, I still see his compassion in, in, in areas, and I see it here, and I see it here. I haven't seen him, but it seems like as a, a, as a major culture. So is this something that our culture has offended him? Maybe us as individuals haven't offended him. We can still feel his pleasure, but as a culture, have we offended him? I would say probably yes. If we're going to look at other cultures that offended him to the point where he allowed them to be completely taken away, I think our culture, our American culture, has offended him. So as individuals, we can still feel his goodness, but even when our culture, if God removes a blessing from our culture, especially the, 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 the most vulnerable are the ones who are going to feel it the most. Oh, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Oh God, I know you are mighty to save. Right? We sing a song, Mighty to Save. I know that's who you are. You've saved so many times. I know you can do it again. Would you do it here? And he goes, well, yeah. If those who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So what he's done is, I have a prescription for Maui. If those who are not the non-believers, but if the church on Maui will humble themselves and pray. We usually have four to six people here praying on Thursday morning. I'd love to see it full. I don't know how it all works in the heavenlies and how God deals with prayers, but he's asked us to pray. And he said, if we humble ourselves and pray, he heals our land. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have made your power redeemed your, you, you have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph and all of us, right? The waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth a sound. Your arrows flashed here and there. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea and your path in the mighty waters and your footprints may not be known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So one of the biggest rescue missions of ever, probably somewhere between two and three million and livestock, God does this incredible rescue mission. And so what Asaph decides to encourage the people with while they're in this place is God has rescued us before and we'll trust that he will rescue us again. And I think for us, God has rescued us before and we can come back in one way or the other for his church, he will rescue us again. And so we just need to dwell on his goodness and who he is and remind ourselves of those things and have other, be around other people who will remind ourselves, who will help pick us out of those pits when there are those pits of pity and despair and self-loathing and all those things. We need sometimes someone just to come and pick us up and lift us and set us on a nice, beautiful place. So, Father, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you're a God who's very patient. I think all of us think you're some too patient at times, and we would like you to act sooner. But, Lord, help us to 
to not question you, but just return to the fact that you're a good, good God. But we ask you to heal our land, to heal our nation, to heal this world, that the world would return to you and that find that you are the way, the truth, and the light. And that they would understand that no one comes to your beautiful Heavenly Father who loved us so much that he sent you. That no one gets to come and be in his presence unless they come through you in your beautiful act of mercy and grace. So encourage us. Encourage your bride tonight, we ask Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.